If you have a Bible, 2 Corinthians 2 is where we're going to be this morning at 2 Corinthians 2. As we continue worship, let's pray. God, may you give us ears to hear what you have to say. May we hear truth in a world of deceit. May we hear love in a world of hatred. May we be grounded in a world that is so full of anxiety. And may we trust that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords and all that we need. And so for that reason, I pray that you would pour through me the gift of preaching. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I got married when I was 21 years old, which is another way of saying I went to a Christian college. <laughs> and it worked out pretty well for me. Uh, my wife has since realized she could definitely have done a whole lot better. About a year and a half after we were married, my wife said to me, Luke, when we were dating, I had a real tough time not confusing you for Jesus. And now I don't have that problem at all. <laughs> In her defense, I used to wear sandals a lot, so it's kind of in longer hair. But she's not the only one who's ever partnered their life, married someone that they thought they were marrying, and it turns out the person's a little bit different from what they thought they were getting. There's a story in scripture about a man named Jacob. Besides, he's going to marry this woman named Rachel, but Rachel's father says, you have to work seven years before you can marry my daughter. And the text says he worked for seven years, but it seemed like just a day to him because of how much he loved her. Seven years seemed like a day because how much... At first, it seems, man, this guy is so romantic. And then you hear the rest of the story in which he actually goes to bed with after marrying the other sister and doesn't realize until the next morning it's the wrong one. And then you realize that he's not a romantic, he's just really bad with details. <laughs> he just married the wrong person. But that's a human phenomenon. Like you, you marry someone you thought you were marrying and life just looks a little different. The Texas theologian Stanley Hauerwas and future writer of Hallmark Cards says this about marriage. Let me read this quote to you. He says, the assumption is that there is someone just right for us to marry and that if we look closely enough, we will find the right person. The moral assumption overlooks a crucial aspect to marriage. It fails to appreciate the fact that we always marry the wrong person. We never know whom we marry. We just think we do. No one said the word of the Lord after that one. <laughs> if you're still looking to find that perfect guest speaker for next Valentine's Day, how are us? You marry the wrong person. It can happen to each and every one of us. Hold that thought. Our text today is 2 Corinthians 2. One of the things we do in Austin is we stand when we read scripture. So I'm going to ask you if you're physically able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? 2 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 14. Scripture says, but thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads in every place the fragrance that comes from knowing him. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, to the one, a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not peddlers of God's word like so many. But in Christ, we speak as persons of sincerity, as persons sent from God and standing in his presence. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. And I don't know about you, but I love a good procession. Now, we don't do many of these in our culture. But what we do have is a victory celebration every time someone wins a Super Bowl. We have them. We have these big processions, right? Like, here, here's a video from two years ago. This is the one down in Tampa, Florida. And if you notice, uh, there they are. They have the Super Bowl trophy. They're out on the boat. They're throwing it back and forth. Uh, they're outside because in Florida, they're always really cautious <clears throat> about not dropping the Super Bowl trophy is what I was talking about. And you see all these people... And this boat parade celebrating this victory that they had. And what I thought was so unique and special about this procession is that you can't tell the actual winners from those who were just spectators. It's a very egalitarian celebration. Everyone's in this together. 
Paul says, Christ leads us in triumphal procession. And I love that idea. It's what I want. Front of the parade, back of the parade, we're all celebrating like we just won this. And really, we're all in the front together. And I love that. That's the idea of triumphal procession. That's something, but I don't know if it's the only one. Let me show you a different image of another triumphal procession. This is May of 1945 in Germany. This is a German superhighway that's being walked upon by German soldiers. It's a triumphal procession, but the ones marching are not the winners. There's, there's no one confused, hey, did you win or did you lose? They're all prisoners of war who have just lost. And I wonder in Scripture when Paul says that Christ leads us in triumphal procession, is that more what Paul is talking about? It's not like some celebration where we're all up front, but we are this spectacle of people who've lost. And maybe along the way, we've married and partnered ourselves with the wrong image for what this procession is all about. In 1 Corinthians, Paul makes this abundantly clear with the language he uses. Let me read this from 1 Corinthians. Paul says these words. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Quite apart from us, you have become kings. Indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we might be kings with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, as though sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and immortals. We are fools for the sake of Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you're strong. You were held in honor, but we in disrepute. Paul says, yeah, you're rich, powerful, what great, but this is what we are. We're a spectacle. Only if the world saw us would they get that we're not people up at the front celebrating like we won, but actually we are prisoners of war who have been caught up in the victory of God, and now our lives are led as a spectacle for the world. Not as winners, but as losers. As losers. I think we've all noticed the church looks different now, feels different now. And I'm not just talking about music and what people wear. I'm talking about the way people experience church. It, it's different. When I grew up, we went to church three times a week, and now the numbers are saying, on average, people come to church two times a month before COVID, which means if you have a church of 100 people and people are coming that often, church feels one way, but now when people are coming even less than that, it feels a different way. I mean, across the board, religion in America, people are less connected to religious communities, synagogues, mosques, temples, churches than ever before. For the first time, it's under 50%. First time in our country. But it's not just other traditions, it's the other religion, it's, it's in the churches of Christ. We, we all know the numbers. 1906, for the first time, we were designated as a denomination to which we're still saying, hey, don't call us that. <laughs> 1906, there's what, 2,600 churches? 160,000 members. 40 years later, that number is quadrupled. Now we're pushing 700,000 members in the churches of Christ. That number continues to grow until 1985. And then ever since then, we've been in decline. Attendance is getting lower. Churches are fewer. It feels different. And for some of us, we partner with this idea that everything was always going to be up and to the right. That we're always going to have this relevant, spectacular, powerful presence. But the cards in front of us seem to be something other than that that we've been dealt. Let me tell you a story. Uh, the year is 1992, and there is a young preacher in Abilene, Texas, named Christopher Eldrick Seedman, who's distraught because ministry for this young man is harder than he thought he was. And so he goes to the source of all compassion in Abilene, Texas, one Charles Seibert. And so this young Christopher is distraught about ministry being harder than he thought. I don't know exactly what he said to him. I can imagine it would be something like, when people listen to me preach, they're just listening to my beautiful, perfect voice, not what I'm actually saying. 
just like eye candy on the stage, or, or something like that I can imagine him saying. <laughs> so he says this, and Dr. Seibert looks at young Christopher and says, you follow a man who ended up on a cross. What makes you think it's going to be easy? You follow a man who ended up on a cross. What made you think it was going to be easy? When I got to Abilene, much after Mr. Christopher Seidman, <laughs> there was a nickname for Dr. Seibert, Chainsaw Charlie, which legend, legend has it comes from Chris Seidman. <laughs> and I would never call Dr. Seibert Chainsaw Charlie to his face that. <laughs> but every time I'd walk into his office, he would look at me and he goes, hey, Luke, are you still wearing those holy jeans and sandals? The joke is at that point, Dr. Seibert was legally blind. Yet he always knew the answer to the question. Of course, of course that's what I'm wearing. The thing about Dr. Seibert is even if he was legally blind, he could perceive what's going on in the room better than almost anyone else. He knew what was going on. And we can only imagine if he was still with us, he would look at this room and know exactly what was going on and ask us the exact same question. You follow a guy who ended up on a cross. What made you think it was going to be easy? What caused you to marry yourself to a vision of what it means to follow Jesus that looks up and to the right? What made you marry yourself to a way of living that says your only witness to the world is if you are powerful and relevant and influential? What made you think that? Because that's not what Paul is calling us to. That's not what Jesus has called us to. Jesus says, if you want to find your life, you must lose your life. And when Paul describes this way of Christianity, it's not you're at the front like you're the winner, but you, you're, you're at the back. You're at the back of the parade. That's where your location is. But no one's ever liked back of the parade thinking. James and John go up to Jesus, or in another gospel, their mom goes to Jesus and says, hey, give us, give us these influential seats. We want to be at the front. When Jesus is trying to tell Peter, hey, there's going to be suffering on this road, Peter goes, no, 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 that can't work. It seems that when Jesus went into the wilderness, the temptations to be relevant, to be spectacular, to be powerful, were temptations that he passed. But it seems that we've been more like the Israelites in the wilderness, struggling with those things a little bit too much. No one likes back of the parade thinking. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. Last night I heard Randy talk about preaching and being angry, which reminded me of the time he got really angry, yelled at me in a preaching class. So let me tell you that story. <laughs> I was a senior in college, and um, I was in a preaching class. And so I preached a sermon. And if you've never been in a preaching class and heard a sermon in a preaching class, it's kind of like like watching romance on a reality show, where like to your eyes it looks like the real thing, but we all know in our heart it, it's just practice. <laughs> it's a little dark, okay? <laughs> so I preached this sermon, and like afterwards everyone goes by the honor code. Like if we honor you enough, you'll get a good grade, and we'll all get a good grade. And so they're giving me these compliments that I didn't deserve. And then there's Randy in the back of the room, just sitting up there with his arms crossed. And eventually he makes that Randy noise, it's like a, a breath or like a pant or something. I don't know what it is. And then he just like rubs his eyes like this. Have you ever seen a shark like attack something? There's like a, an eyelid that comes up when they're about to attack. <laughs> Luke, what was that word you said about that coworker in the story you told? Context. I was working in the Bay Area that summer before I came back to school. And so I want to caveat what I'm about to say before I say that I use the word chick in a sermon. Otherwise, I'll end up in a book like Jesus and Laird Hamilton or something. <laughs> and I tell him, yes, I use that word. And he goes, Luke, why did you use that word? And I'm just like fumbling for any, I, I don't know. I, I didn't think about it. And he goes, how dare you defame the word of God with your lack of preparation? And then he ends the class and he walks out of the room. And so I was like, I guess I'm going to law school now. Um, <laughs> So the next morning, I'm back at my rent house in Abilene with my roommates, and there's a phone call. We, we had phones back then in our house, and I answered it, 
and it was, that's how old I am. And it was Randy. Luke, this is Randy. I'm like, oh, oh, what, what? Okay, like I'm starting to brace. And he goes, Luke, I just want to call to apologize to you. I shouldn't have embarrassed you in front of your friends. And in that moment, as a 20-year-old, I go, you didn't need to apologize. Like, I shouldn't have said that word. And he goes, no, I didn't mean to embarrass you in front of your friends, and I shouldn't have done that. My question is, what kind of person apologizes to a sophomoric college student? Someone who's okay to be at the back of the parade. Someone who thinks that their witness isn't contingent upon being relevant or being spectacular or being powerful, but someone whose life has been caught up in the victory of God and now you're okay to be a prisoner of war, no matter what it makes you look like. For some, that feels like a death sentence. But for others, there's life in that. Let me read our text again for today from 2 Corinthians 2. Paul says, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one a fragrance from death to, to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. It depends on who's experiencing this. For, for some, it's death. For others, it's life. And this call to live as a prisoner of war whose life has been caught up in the way of Jesus feels like death to some and life to others. It depends on your relationship to it. My first job out of school was in uh, Florida on the Gulf Coast. And my wife and I, we lived just southwest of the paper mill in this small town in Florida. And whenever the wind would blow a certain direction, we would actually smell the paper mill. And soon after getting there, I smelled this pungent odor. And I asked a, a local person who'd been there his entire life, I said, what is, what is that smell? And he said, that's the smell of money. He's like, you're a dentist. No. Um, but what he knew is in a small town, a factory is vital for the economy. It's jobs. It's resources. It's life for a small community like that. The idea of giving your life up, of being someone who doesn't hold on but empties themselves. If you have the relationship to Jesus, if you have the connection to the death, burial, and resurrection, if your life has been merged and lost in the waters of baptism and you've been resurrected a new person, it doesn't feel like you're dying. It feels like you're finally experiencing life. Because the way of Jesus is always an invitation to die to yourself so that you can experience life. All right, let me tell you another story about uh, foolish things that I did when I was a young preacher. Uh, when I was 20, I thought it was a great idea to include in sermons a, an SAT word. Like I was teaching vocab in church, uh, which is like so annoying. Like who wants to hear their preacher say, well, you know, Paul was against people who were against the establishment, which makes him the first anti-disestablishment imperialist. Like that is, that's awful. It's a great way to teach your church the word insufferable. <laughs> but let me talk to you about the word disabuse which means to convince someone of the faultiness of an idea, to disabuse. I feel like many of us need to be disabused of this idea that we're supposed to be at the front of the parade. We need to be disabused of the idea of up and to the right is the only metric for success to ever look at. We need to be disabused of the notion that being relevant and spectacular and powerful is kingdom work. Because sometimes we think that's the only witness we have to the world. And if we don't have that, we've got, we've got nothing. And you look at the numbers and you go, this is not very encouraging. If that's the story you're telling yourself and these are the numbers in front of us, no matter, no, it's not a surprise that many of us feel like we've, we're that spare tire that's trying to go 200 miles and there's no way we can make it. Because we're trying to be something we can't. Because we think our offering, our testimony, our witness to the world is us being something that God never called us to be. I've got a buddy of mine uh, who was a Marine, uh, active duty for years, was the recipient of uh, two Purple Hearts. And then after that, he got into uh, teaching martial arts at Quantico in uh, like the Virginia area. And so whenever a Marine would want to become a, a martial arts instructor, they would go to the hub and learn how to instruct. And so he's there uh, teaching like the, those Marines how to uh, fight, which 
It's a little different than my experience in the GST at ACU. And every day, they would teach skills and PowerPoint, but at the end of the day, they were teaching martial arts. And so every day, he would fight. And he told me that if anyone was an instructor at the hub and they lost, they lost their job. And so every day, you're competing against these Marines, who are the best of the best, trying to get better as martial artists. And if you lose to them, you, you get one warning, but the second time it happens, you lost your job. Can you imagine how exhausting that would be? I bet you can, because many of you live that way. Like, if we're not relevant enough, if we're not spectacular enough, if we're not powerful enough, we have nothing to offer the world, and we are done with our witness to the world around us. Maybe, maybe we need to be disabused of that idea. Because our power and our influence has never been about how successful we are. It's always about the resurrection. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 1. Scripture says these words. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death so that we would rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. The hope has always been in the way that our life is married and partnered with the story of the resurrection. And when things are tough, and things are overwhelming, and when you're exhausted, may you remember that what you have to offer the world is the spectacle of your life being lost in the resurrection. What you have to offer the world, what your voice is to the world, is that you have found life in dying. Let me give you another quote by Stanley Hauerwas. In his newest book, he has this line where he says, the challenge in the shadows of a dying Christendom is how to recover a strong theological voice without betraying the fragility of all speech, but particularly speech about God. In the shadows of a dying Christendom, in a world that you and I have experienced, the challenge is how do we recover a strong theological voice without betraying the fragility of speech, but particularly speech about God. The fragility of our speech is an acknowledgement that we are weak, we are frail, and we don't have it all together. But the strength in our voice is the death, and resurrection of Jesus. The strength that we have to offer is we believe God became a person, God took on the form of humanity, God died, God overcame death, and now invites us to experience that life too. So may the power of the resurrection be enough for us today. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the hope that we have in the death, and resurrection of Jesus. For those of us who have partnered ourselves with a vision of discipleship that requires us to always be up and to the right, may you give us strength to trust that the resurrection is more than enough for us. For those of us who are discouraged and downtrodden, who feel struck down, who feel destroyed, may we trust that the resurrection can bring us back to life too. We pray this in the name of the resurrected one. Amen.